Okay, welcome to the second lecture for our class. I'm calling this one Thinking About Drug Use and Abuse. Uh, probably kind of a vague title, but one that at least gets us started in some of the really interesting things that we'll be talking about throughout this semester. So as an overview for this lecture, I'm just going to begin by talking a little bit about how we think about drug use, some of the different messages that are out there in the broad culture, in the media about drug use. And then I'm going to focus on different types of drugs and different types of drug use behaviors and explore some basic definitions that we apply to these things. So first off, messages about drug use. Now obviously you don't need me to tell you or you don't need to take a class to know that there are a lot of different messages about what drugs are, what types of drug use are out there, the types of risks and benefits associated with it, and so on. Clearly one image we have of drugs is, as, is that they are dangerous, or that they are criminal. But clearly there's also an image of drugs, at least of some drugs, that they're in some way alluring or cool or even fun to use. Obviously, some drugs are illegal, at least for most people in most places, while other drugs are legal, again, for most people or in most places. We can sometimes see drug use portrayed as a healthy activity, part of a, a, you know, a natural, complete, and even, um, again, healthy lifestyle. But then drugs also, even the same drug, alcohol in this case, can clearly be seen as an unhealthy part of a lifestyle or a dangerous thing for someone to do. We often talk about drugs as being a personal choice and of course clearly the decision to use or not use drugs is a choice that each individual can make. At the same time, we understand that decisions about using drugs are influenced by various aspects of each individual's neurobiology. In fact, we'll spend a fair bit of time this semester talking about this very idea. So biology plays a role in those personal decisions. Likewise, psychological and social factors can play a role in decisions about which drugs to use or how to use particular drugs. I could go on, but the point I'm trying to make here is that the messages that are out there, the images that are out there about drugs and drug use can be mixed or even contradictory, even for the same drugs. And the important idea is that there's a diversity of drugs and drug use behaviors out there. And I'd like to encourage you, or encourage all of us really, to not oversimplify this complexity. When we think about drugs, when we think about drug use behaviors, we're almost always confronted with complexity. And I think it's worth recognizing that complexity and to use a quote that's been attributed to Albert Einstein, let's make things as simple as possible, but not simpler. Let's not oversimplify something which can be complicated. Another important idea out that I'd like to make is that drug use isn't just an issue for young people. Um, I'll argue, and of course other people have, that everyone uses some drugs at least some of the time. I think, uh, I know for me growing up, uh, when I learned about drugs in school especially, or from parents or from other adults in my life, drugs were often presented as this dangerous thing that young people did and they really ought not to do. Now there's certainly some ways in which those, type of those types of messages are true, but a more truthful or more complete picture is that almost everyone is using some drugs some of the time. And so again, we're not trying to oversimplify things. So with that in mind, let's move on and talk a little bit about drugs and behavior. And here, what I want to do is explore some basic definitions that may seem a little bit dull or even obvious, but which will be helpful, I think, as we move forward in our future lectures throughout the rest of this semester. So the first thing is a drug. For our purposes, a drug is going to be considered anything that alters the structure or functioning of the body, now especially of the nervous system. Um, 
Also, I want to point out that we're thinking of drugs as substances which have these effects, but, but which are not nutrients that are necessary for normal functioning. So, you know, arguably anything you eat or otherwise take into your body is likely to alter the structure or functioning of your body, but many of the things that you do this to, food, beverages, you pretty much have to. You know, the, the nutrition in the food you eat is altering your body, but we're not really considering that a drug effect because presumably you need that nutrition to survive. You don't need marijuana to survive. You don't need alcohol or nicotine or caffeine to survive. Although some days it does feel like I need caffeine to survive. Um, this is interesting though uh, because it raises at least one kind of curious question. You know, pictured here you can see some of the common spices that are used in Indian cuisine, a, a type of cooking that I'm very fond of. I like to cook so I make a lot of curry and dishes like that at home. Um, many of these spices which are used in Indian cuisine and other world cuisines have uh, effects on the body, um, including some psychological effects. And it's, you know, there's a certain blurred boundary between what is technically a food and what is technically a drug. A more vivid example of this boundary is when we look at, uh, comes up when we look at herbal supplements, of which there are many. You can buy at almost all stores now, Target, Walmart, local grocery stores, health food stores, various uh, concoctions of allegedly herbs and uh, other natural compounds, which are in some respects like food in that they purport to provide nutrient value to your body, but also purport to provide or to uh, produce changes in how your body works or is structured. So it's a little bit of a blur there. The definition is not precise, but again, for our purposes, a drug is something which in some way alters the structure or functioning of the body. Now, this class is a class on uh, psychology. It's in the psychology department. So really what we're going to focus on are psychoactive drugs. And these are just drugs which in some way alter the structure or functioning of the nervous system. And in a future lecture or two, we're going to talk a lot more about the nervous system, about the various parts, particularly about the brain. Uh, what's interesting or important here is that because psychoactive drugs are altering the structure or functioning of the brain, they're changing the way that system does what it's supposed to do, changing the way we perceive the world around us, the way we think, the way we feel emotionally, and of course the way we behave. An important point that I want to make here is that what we're doing here by laying out some basic definitions and talking about ways of grouping or categorizing things is a part of basic science. Um, almost all sciences, whether we're talking about astronomy or biology, chemistry, physics, whatever, um, almost all of them use grouping and classification, trying to find things which are like each other, put them in one group as distinct from things which are not like them in other groups. Um, this is useful because it helps us to understand some of the common features or indeed the distinguishing features of whatever it is we're studying. In our case, it's drugs and various types of behavior. Um, that understanding is important because it helps us to begin to ask questions about the underlying mechanisms. What makes all drugs in a particular group work in a similar way? What makes the, them work differently than other types of drugs? In what ways are behaviors associated with addiction different from drug use behaviors that are not associated with addiction. That classifying and grouping is really um, a starting point or very close to a starting point for a lot of what we think about is, is being science. While keeping that in mind, it's important to remember that no classification system is perfect. Um, all attempts to classify things in psychology or indeed in other sciences will kind of work but kind of not work. So attempts to classify different types of animals in zoology, you know, we can see here a picture of the platypus as an example of a, an animal which of course fits into its own uh, species um, it, within its own genus, I believe, I forget my biology class, but is shares features with a number of different other animals like it lays eggs, it has a duck bill, it has webbed feet, but it also has warm blood like a mammal. So point here is that classification systems work some of the times, they don't always work, but they're often useful because they help us to think about whatever it is we're studying, whether that is um, Australian semi-aquatic animals or in our case uh, drugs and drug use behaviors. So with all that in mind, psychoactive drugs are a really diverse group of, uh, of, um, of chemicals. Uh, how can we classify them?
Well, there are a number of different ways. One way is to classify drugs by origin, that is, by the natural source that it comes from or that it resembles. So if you think about the uh, last uh, class uh, that, uh, or the last lecture I gave, I talked about opiate analgesics. Um, these include drugs which are directly derived chemically from the opium poppy or which chemically resemble the molecules that you can get from an opium poppy. Um, this is a good way of classifying drugs uh, except that drugs from different sources can sometimes have similar effects. So if we look at drugs in the stimulant group, uh, drugs like cocaine or amphetamine or methamphetamine, these drugs come from different plant sources but influence the nervous system in a similar way. So if you were to only classify drugs by their natural origin, you would sometimes have complication where you would be grouping apart or separating drugs which work very in very similar ways just because they come from different sources. Another way to classify drugs is by their therapeutic use. That is, what does the drug do or what can it be used for by humans? So, you know, um, again, from my last lecture, I talked about <clears throat> analgesics. These are drugs which are used to treat pain. The opiates are, generally speaking, a very powerful uh, class of analgesic drugs. So you could, if you wanted to, classify all the different types of drugs that are out there in terms of the types of purposes or therapeutic uses that we can put them to. The problem here is that not all drugs have obvious therapeutic purposes or have therapeutic purposes which are controversial. You know, in the last lecture I talked about the medicinal use of marijuana. Another good example of this might be the medicinal use of psychedelic uh, fungi like uh, magic mushrooms. Uh, psilocybin bearing mushrooms and other mushrooms which produce hallucinogenic effects in humans. Many people, probably most people, consider these recreational drugs that have perhaps no therapeutic purpose, but there's a small and growing uh, body of scientific research which suggests that these uh, drugs can be used for people who are facing uh, severe uh, end-of-life depression, you know, associated with severe illness or just associated with the onset of age, and there may be ways to use these drugs to help people overcome severe psychological distress associated with facing one's own demise. So therapeutic use could be a way to classify drugs, but if we did that, we did occasionally have some complications because not all drugs have obvious or uh, universally agreed upon therapeutic uses. Yet another way to classify drugs would be by their chemical structure or their mechanism, how the drug chemically affects the body or especially the brain. So again, uh, another way we could classify drugs is uh, just about uh, in terms of how they affect the body, how they affect the brain. Um, an example of this might be the various subtypes of hallucinogenic drugs, which are often grouped together based on the neurotransmitter systems in the brain that they influence, whether those are serotonin systems or uh, norepinephrine systems or other systems. Um, this is a useful way to classify drugs because often the types of effects that drugs have on people have an awful lot to do with the parts of the brain, the structures of the brain that are most influenced when those drugs are taken. So classifying drugs in this way is often a really useful uh, approach to take, except that we don't fully understand how all drugs work. So a drug like marijuana uh, is a really good example. Um, there are chemicals within marijuana which we know a lot about, like uh, delta, delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol, um, THC, uh, which is the most powerful or uh, is at least the best studied, um, uh, you know, a, chemical in marijuana, but there are countless other chemicals within marijuana which affect the brain in ways that we don't fully understand. So classifying drugs by their chemical structure or mechanism is a good idea. It often works, but there are sometimes situations in which it doesn't work that well because we just frankly don't understand those chemical structures or mechanisms as well as we would like to. Okay, one other thing we could do or one other way we could classify drugs is by uh, looking at their street name, that is, uh, what people call the drugs uh, out on the street, you know, when people are buying drugs, especially illegal drugs. And again, we can look here at subtypes of hallucinogens, which are sometimes, uh, you know, grouped together or given similar uh, names. Um, this works well um, 
except that those names, of course, change a lot over time. You know, the type of slang or common language that people use to describe different drugs is sort of an ever-evolving thing. And if we wanted to classify drugs strictly by what people out in the real world called them, we would constantly be changing our classification system. Okay, so the point of all this so far is classification, it's important for science. Uh, we probably need to do it. There are different ways to do it with regards to drugs, but no way is exactly perfect. Okay, think about this. Um, here's some practice that you can do in classifying a drug. Now imagine you're confronted with a new drug. You're a researcher, or perhaps you're a um, police officer, or perhaps you're a healthcare provider, and you come into contact with a new drug that your clients or the people you work with are using. Its appearance is a crystalline powder. It can be taken into the body or administered a number of different ways. It could be snorted or inhaled uh, by smoking. And the types of effects that people have, uh, that it has on people include very powerful feelings of energy, even euphoria, that's strong positive emotions, but also uh, feelings of agitation and even paranoia. Now, this is not an entirely imaginary example. There are a whole group of drugs which are sometimes labeled as bath salts, uh, which in different places in the country used to be sold quite openly but now less so which look a little bit like this picture here and uh, which are uh, uh, you know have some of the effects that I've described the question that I would pose to you is how could we classify this relatively new drug okay one thing we could do is classify the drug by origin where does it come from well, it's a synthetic drug, meaning it's made from scratch in a laboratory from chemical reagents that a chemist could purchase. It's not derived from a specific plant or fungi or other natural source, so it's a synthetic drug. It happens to be similar to cathinone. Cathinone is a naturally occurring chemical that can be derived from the cat plant. So if we wanted to, we could call this new drug a synthetic cathinone. And in fact, this drug is sometimes classified as a synthetic cathinone if you want to classify it by its origin. Another way we could classify this drug is by its therapeutic use. But in this case, it, there is no therapeutic or medical use for the drug. It's not even labeled as a drug. As I noted, the name given to it uh, is sometimes uh, uh, called it, they're sometimes called bath salts to dis to, to uh, disguise the fact that it even is a drug. So it can be sold kind of semi legally uh, in gas stations or in other places where people who sort of know what it is can buy it without coming under uh, scrutiny from police officers or other uh, f uh, other uh, law enforce enforcement or medical professionals. So we'll talk about that in just a little bit more. So if we want to classify this drug in terms of its therapeutic use, we might be out of luck because there really doesn't appear to be any. Um, people basically use it just to feel high or good in some way or another. So if we wanted to classify it this way, we could at the very least just call it a recreational drug. It's a drug people use for fun. It's not a drug people seem to use for any known therapeutic purpose. So this is a second attempt to classify. It gives us a slightly different answer or a different way of thinking. A third way we could classify is by its uh, the chemical uh, uh, mechanism or structure of the drug, the drug action it has within the brain. Uh, here, the drug is chemically similar to amphetamine, um, and it affects the nervous system in similar ways. As you probably know, amphetamines are drugs which produce powerful stimulant effects on the body. People who take amphetamines feel more alert, more energized, in some cases more happy or positive in terms of their outlook. They can also become more agitated or even paranoid. Um, similar effects to what we observe with our new drug here. Uh, again, effects which are similar to those I've described before. So if we wanted to use this approach to classification, we might say that our new drug is a stimulant, or we should put it together with all the other stimulants that we already know about, things like amphetamine, methamphetamine, cocaine, etc. Yet another way of classifying drugs gives us a somewhat different perspective on what the drug is or how we should group it together with other drugs. Last way we can use is the 
classifying the drug by its street name. And as I've already uh, noted, this drug, um, which actually isn't one drug, it's actually a whole raft of different drugs which are kind of chemically similar, are often labeled as bath salts or plant food. They often have on their package labels that say not for human consumption. This is done um, deliberately to discourage legal investigation. And, and now, you know, in a sense, the cat is out of the bag or the drug is out of the bag. Nowadays, police and, uh, and other law enforcement officials are kind of have caught on to this. But for many years, if you knew where to look, you could find in sort of shady gas stations or other sort of um, other stores or places drugs which were marketed not as drugs, but as things like bath salts that you would allegedly mix in the water if you're taking a bath, if that's something you still do, um, or that you would add to your plants if you grow plants at home. But really what they were were these synthetic cathinones or chemically similar drugs, uh, which were just given these names to discourage uh, um, sort of proper oversight and investigation. So we use this classification system, we're kind of out of luck because what on earth do you call a drug which is called bath salts or plant food? Okay, so a couple important ideas here. One is that the same drug, this new drug, which is a real drug, it's out there, can have different classifications depending, uh, depending on the perspective that we take. The idea here is that classification systems are useful in that they help us to think about what we're studying. It may be valuable to find this new drug and group it together with other drugs to help us think about how to best study it or best regulate its use. Um, but it depends a lot on why we're trying to classify the drug. You know, for the purposes of a police officer or a prosecutor, classifying the drug as simply an illegal drug may be sufficient. For a uh, pharmacologist who's exploring the chemical structure of a drug, it may be useful to group it together with other drugs which are chemically similar to it, um, and so on and so on. So we talked about different ways to classify drugs. Now let's talk about different ways to classify drug use behaviors. And here we're faced with a similar challenge. Um, just as there are a diversity or a complexity of different drugs, there's a diversity or complexity in terms of different drug use. People use drugs for different reasons and that should be fairly obvious to you. The question we have now is how do we classify these different behaviors? One way we can classify behaviors is to make a distinction between instrumental and recreational use. And this is somewhat tricky, but bear with me, I think you'll get the idea. Instrumental use is basically use of a drug for a socially um, approved goal or reason. In contrast, recreational drug or, or recreational use is the use of a drug to experience um, pleasant or enjoyable or just fun psychoactive effects. So a particular drug like Xanax here, Alprazolam, could be used, uh, it, it is a um, it is a, a, a mild anti-anxiety drug, could be used for the socially proved goal of treating an anxiety disorder if you were prescribed it by a doctor or a psychiatrist, or it could be used recreationally if you just enjoy taking a few of these drugs and feeling the kind of vaguely high feeling you get when you abuse Xanax. So again, instrumental use is used for a socially approved goal. But you might ask, well, what is a socially approved goal? Who gets to decide what's socially approved? Um, most often when we use this distinction, we're talking about things which are medically appropriate. Uh, therapeutic uses that doctors, nurses, psychiatrists, psychologists, people like that deem appropriate usually for treatment of a recognized illness or a, a medical condition. Generally speaking, what instrumental use involved is used to decrease some sort of a negative state. So alprazolam can be used to treat acute anxiety. Uh, if we're using it instrumentally, that's what we're using it for rather than just to have fun or to feel high. Of course, in contrast, recreational use is the use to experience interesting or pleasant psychoactive effects. Um, but you could make the point, all drugs, you know, at least all psychoactive drugs, by definition, have these types of effects. Why, uh, you know, how do we decide what counts as recreational if every drug, every psychoactive drug you take in some way affects your, your mind, your thoughts, your feelings, your behavior? Um, here, generally speaking, uh, we're talking about use of a drug 
when the goal is to experience those effects rather than to treat a particular problem. And generally speaking, what we're trying to do is to increase a positive state. So abusing alprazolam uh, can be fun. It can give you kind of a vaguely high sort of mellow feeling, but that's not typically the sort of thing where you, we do to treat an illness. This is more just to have fun to use recreationally. Now at this point you may be wondering, instrumental use or, or recreational use? It's honestly not always clear. You know, for any one person, someone may begin, in, begin using a drug for one reason and then over time use it for other reasons. To use this example that I've returned to again and again, the opiate analgesics are a bit like this. You know, a number, you know, many people begin using these medications when they're prescribed them by doctors or nurses or psychiatrists or dentists, you know, for treatment of pain. But then over time, go on to use them recreationally because they enjoy the feeling associated with these drugs. This distinction again is still somewhat useful. Um, in that it highlights the different motivations for using, especially as related to emotional states. A lot of times when it comes down to thinking about use of drugs, uh, use of psychoactive drugs, it has to do with the way people change or manage their emotional states. So uh, whether you're using a drug to reduce a negative state, especially one that's medically recognized like pain from an injury, that's probably instrumental use or you're managing anxiety because you have an, a diagnosed anxiety disorder, that's instrumental use. If you're using a drug because you enjoy feeling kind of numb and, and sort of mellowed out, that's probably a pleasant feeling that you're pursuing. So maybe that's more like recreational use. Again, the distinction isn't precise, it's not always clear, but it is a useful thing to think about because it highlights these motivations, especially these emotion-related motivations for use. So another way we can talk about drug use is making a distinction between illicit use, that's use of a drug that's illegal, and licit use, that's use of a drug that's legal. This may seem fairly obvious, but of course, illicit drug is just a drug that's illegal, at least for you. Um, you know, clearly, uh, it may be it's illegal for a teenager to use alcohol or to use nicotine and cigarettes, but it wouldn't be for someone in their 20s. For some drugs, people, regardless of age, it is illegal to use them. Um, a question you might ask is, well, how do we decide what's illegal? Um, certainly the illegal status of drugs has changed a lot over time. I'll highlight that in many of my future lectures. It's actually an interesting phenomenon that the whole idea of drugs being illegal at all is relatively recent. You don't need to go back much more than about 100 years, barely even that, and you would live in a world where all drugs are legal. You know, the idea that drugs should be restricted from people is a relatively new, historically speaking, idea. And drugs like marijuana are rapidly changing in terms of their legal standing as different states change laws about how legal or illegal that drug is. Um, it's an interesting thing, it changes over time. Generally speaking, when we're talking about illicit drugs, um, we're talking about use of risky drug or drug use that's risky in some ways. So the use of street drugs uh, generally are thought to be uh, use of drugs that are dangerous to use. Um, but again, we can ask an interesting question. You know, if illicit drug use is is risky or dangerous drug use, how do we decide what is risky? And this can be kind of tricky. In fact, in a whole future three lectures, I'll talk about the idea of risky drug use and how do we decide how risky or not risky a drug is. Marijuana is an illegal drug, at least for most people in most places at this point in time in our country. Um, how risky that drug is, is very debatable um, and can be thought about in different ways. So anyway, this distinction between licit and illicit is interesting. It's kind of useful. Um, if you put those that distinctions or those two distinctions together, instrumental versus recreational, licit versus illicit, you can get kind of a four square where you can think about drugs in different ways. So here's just some examples. You, know, you could imagine someone who is uh, in the bottom left corner having an alcoholic drink to relax before dinner um, or smoking a cigarette or a cigar for enjoyment. Now, assuming that person is above legal age to purchase alcohol or, or, or tobacco products, that person is doing something that's licit, that's legal, but they're doing it for pursuit of an enjoyable, pleasant, positive state. So it's probably recreational use. Uh, 
Um, you could imagine someone uh, who is uh, doing something which is illegal uh, but recreational. So in the bottom right corner, there's someone who's smoking marijuana to get high or taking LSD to enjoy the hallucinogenic effects of that drug. Again, uh, with the exception of, uh, or with the eye towards marijuana, assuming that person lives somewhere where marijuana is not decriminalized um, and thus has had to purchase that drug illegally, we're going to assume that that's illicit for them. LSD is basically illicit almost everywhere. Um, but the idea here is those people are pursuing positive states so it's probably recreational use. And again, you can go through the other two squares to get the idea of how these things sort of go together. So here's something to think about. Practice classifying drug use. Here's a little scenario that I made up. So this is not a real person, but let's imagine that there's someone named Steve and he attends Minnesota State University in Moorhead. Um, his classwork is challenging. At the end of a busy day, Steve often feels tired and anxious. He finds that smoking marijuana helps him to deal with these feelings. After smoking, Steve feels relaxed and less worried. He also feels giddy and high. Moreover, many of his hobbies and other activities, for instance, playing guitar, seem more interesting and fun when he's high than when he isn't. How would we classify this type of drug use using the system that we uh, just kind of laid out, or those two basic distinctions which I just laid out? Well, first we might ask, is this instrumental or recreational use? Well, the drug use decreases negative feelings, but it also increases some positive feelings. So the precise understanding of how uh, recre instrumental or recreational the drug is might not be totally clear. Let's assume that Steve hasn't been diagnosed with an anxiety disorder or other you know, mental illness and thus isn't using marijuana medicinally. Um, and let's also assume that for at least some of the time that he's using this drug, he's you know, more interested in the positive feelings increasing than he is in the negative feelings decreasing. If that's the case, we might want to tip the scale and call it recreational use. But again, if Steve has been diagnosed with an anxiety disorder, if he principally uses marijuana to reduce his anxiety, then maybe we might want to shift the dial or just tip the scale more in the direction of, instru of instrumental use. It may not be entirely clear. What about illicit or illicit use? Marijuana possession is illegal in Minnesota, but it is decriminalized, meaning that uh, for the most, in, for most people in most places, purchasing or having small amounts of the drug is treated as a civil violation, not a criminal violation. So if you were in Moorhead, Minnesota and you had a small amount of marijuana and you were caught by a police officer, you'd likely be given a warning or maybe a ticket. You probably wouldn't be arrested or charged with a misdemeanor or a felony or anything like that. It's also the case in Minnesota, and I talked about this in a previous lecture, that ma uh, marijuana is medicalized. So if Steve, in this example, had purchased his marijuana from a, li a licensed dispensary, if he was using it under medical supervision, that drug might be licit for him to use. So how legal or illegal the drug is for him, it's going to have a lot to do um, with his motivations for use and also, frankly, just where he's using it or how he's procuring the drug. So does Steve fit these criteria? It's hard to say. I mean, I haven't really given you enough information to be totally clear, but hopefully I have given you enough inf information to start thinking. An important idea here, it, like I've said before, is that these type of distinctions are useful, but they're not always easy to make. Um, this is not a great image, but it, it's a, if you look closely, you can see that it is a fluid extract of cannabis indica. This is a medication that you could have purchased actually with no prescription or no uh, doctor's approval back around the turn of the 20th century when marijuana and most other drugs were entirely legal to purchase. So. Uh, marijuana is a really fascinating drug in many ways, one of which is its history, how it has been treated as legal or illegal or med medicinal or non-medicinal at different points in our history over the last hundred years or so. So again, we've talked about classifying drugs, we've talked about classifying drug use behaviors. We can also talk about classifying drug use problems, or the idea that some patterns of drug use are problematic some are not problematic. Uh, 
um, how are the different or what are some of the different ways we can classify drug use behaviors that are problematic or the types of problems that arise for some people with drugs well one way we can classify or one distinction we can make is the identification of drug misuse and this is basically using a drug for any reason other than the one that's commonly recognized or recommended so this would include uh, recreational use of drugs um, pretty much all uh, recreational use of drugs or uh, medicinal um, uh, uh, abuse of medications using medications for reasons other than those that uh, they were officially identified for or that they were officially prescribed for uh, this is a picture of the actor Heath Ledger who probably many of you might know most famously from his portrayal of the Joker in one of the Batman movies I don't remember which anyway as you probably know this actor died at a fairly young age I think he was in his 30s um, from an apparent overdose of a number of different uh, medications I actually had them listed on a separate slide but I don't have it handy here suffice it to say that he had a lot of different medications in his system at the time he died which likely contributed to his death um, there was at the time he died I think some suspicion that it might have been a suicide attempt but it's not entirely clear point is he was misusing medications that he'd been given by uh, different physicians and healthcare providers uh, we might call that uh, tragically an example of medication abuse or drug misuse another uh, uh, kind of classification or distinction we can make is drug abuse you've certainly heard this phrase before drug abuse is usually defined as use that results in impairment that is impairment in your in terms of your body your physical health your mental health uh, impairment in terms of your personal or social functioning so if you're using a drug uh, and it's causing uh, negative effects in your health or your mental health it's causing you to miss out on opportunities in your life or fail in uh, your endeavors or uh, damaging your relationships or your work you're likely uh, could be described as drug abusing at that point the emphasis here is on some of the negative consequences of drug abuse uh, that's important because I think uh, for people who are not familiar with how uh, drug use problems are identified and described there's a temptation sometimes to uh, judge how much whether or not someone is abusing a drug based on how much they're using you know if someone is drinking one drink a day of alcohol uh, versus someone's drinking four drinks a day is the second person abusing alcohol and the first person isn't yeah you know, we might certainly wonder about the person who's drinking four drinks a day you know is that healthy for various reasons but what we want to really focus on is the negative problems that are occurring in that person's life if that person is having health problems because of his high level of drinking or he's having work problems or social problems then those are the things those negative effects those negative consequences are the clues that might lead us to identify or describe him as being drug abusing a related idea that comes up or a related diagnosis that can sometimes be made by a healthcare professional is drug dependence and drug dependence can involve a lot of different criteria I'll talk about this more extensively in future lectures but basically or at least for, for the time being it involves a condition of using more than more, more of a drug than is intended uh, using more frequently than you really intended to being preoccupied with using the drug having repeated attempts to quit or cut down that have failed and um, also for many people building up a tolerance such that more and more drug is needed to achieve the desired effect or experiencing withdrawal such that when you stop using a drug uh, negative symptoms occur which might then drive you to go back to using drug uh, using the drug um, here the emphasis is on a kind of a loss of control over one's own drug use if uh, you know someone has uh, little ability to control his drug use he ends up drinking more than he really plans to he's kind of preoccupied with using alcohol if he's got very high tolerance and if he experiences withdrawal symptoms when he tries to cut down drinking well that person might be described as drug dependent or in a more common everyday language as described as addicted to a drug and these terms things like misuse abuse dependence come up in different diagnostic systems that healthcare providers use when they're working with clients who may have problematic drug use behaviors.
one of these diagnostic systems, the one that we're probably going to spend the most time focusing on, on, is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the DSM, the American Psychiatric Association. It's a uh, large book, it's sometimes called the Bible of uh, Mental Health Diagnosis. Um, it's, it really is just a set of guidelines that allow a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a physician or a nurse or a social worker to make an identification of whether the person, uh, whether a particular person has a drug use problem that could be called abuse or dependence. Now that distinction, abuse or dependence, existed in the most, in the last version of the DSM, the DSM-4-TR. Uh, the not quite most recent version of this diagnostic system. The newest diagnostic system is called DSM-5. Um, it's an update of those diagnostic criteria, and I'll talk about it a little bit in the future, but for now uh, it's, suffi it's sufficient to know that because of some overlap between the diagnosis of abuse and the diagnosis of dependence, it was decided that it's kind of difficult sometimes to make a distinction between the two. Often people who are diagnosed as drug dependent, you know, say cannabis dependent, alcohol dependent, are often also necessarily going to be diagnosed as uh, alcohol abusing or cannabis abusing. So that, that idea that you sort of have this slight overlap or mixing of these two diagnoses troubled some of the people who write the DSM and in DSM-5 they kind of combined both of these into one category and added some additional descriptors for uh, different types of drug use problems. Now all that's important um, you know, it's interesting, we'll talk about it a little bit in the future. Uh, the key thing here uh, is just to um, note that, well, I'm sorry, I got a little bit ahead of myself. Um, the, the, in the DSM-5, they added a criteria for craving and they added a way of classifying how mild, moderate, or severe the problem is. Um, so again, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit uh, in the future, but Suffice it to say that nowadays most psychiatrists, psychologists, physicians, nurses, etc. would diagnose a condition called substance use disorder and they would add additional information to characterize how severe that disorder is. Information that includes things like the criteria for drug abuse and the criteria for drug dependence. I got a little bit ahead of myself in that last slide but the point I was going towards was the idea that um, Drug use, uh, you know, problematic patterns of drug use, I, sh I should say, are um, they're important to understand, and the way we think about them has a lot to do with impairment, distress, and disability, and also loss of control. So when we're just trying to understand, is a particular person abusing a drug, dependent on a drug? Do they have, under the new diagnostic system, a substance use disorder with a certain set of criteria? We're often focusing on the types of problems that drug use is causing in that person's life and whether or not that person is frankly losing control of his or her ability to use drugs. Okay, another chance to practice and do some thinking. Um, I want you to watch a, a short video clip which I will put online. It's from the HBO series Addiction which came out quite a few years ago. It's a sort of an old series but a very good one that includes profiles of different families with drug use related problems. Um, the segment I'm going to link to is called A Mother's Desperation and it focuses on a mother of a young woman who has a fairly severe drug use problem. Um, what I would like you to do is try to identify the types of criteria for abuse and dependence that you see in this person. So some of the information on the previous slides I'd like you to pay attention to that and see if you can see elements of impairment, of distress and disability associated with drug use for this young woman and also elements of dependence, loss of control over use. You know, uh, this is your chance to uh, practice being a diagnostician even if you're fairly new to psychology and don't have a lot of background in diagnostics, this is a good chance to practice. And it's a very interesting and, and uh, in some ways a very sad story that deserves some attention. Okay, some important ideas here to share. Um, there are different ways of classifying drugs, drug use, problematic drug use. Um, as I've said already, none of them are perfect. Um, but most of them are useful and for almost all sciences classification 
uh, is an important step in beginning to understand something. So I think it's worth our time thinking about that today, spending a little time watching a video and trying to apply what we've learned. Um, hopefully it's useful. I find this stuff fascinating uh, and I hope you do too. As a preview, in our next lecture, what we'll see is, um, or what I'll try and present, is some discussion of current patterns of drug use, so how we understand what percentage of people use different drugs, um, how those patterns of use have changed over the years, because in many cases they have, and it's interesting to notice those changes and to speculate as to what has caused those changes. So some good stuff coming up. I'm looking forward to talking about it. I hope you're looking forward to listening to me, um, but for now, well, that's all for today's lecture. Um, if you made it this far, thanks for your attention. And uh, hopefully you can take a break now, maybe have yourself a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, something refreshing. Give yourself a little bit of time to let all this information sink in. And then when you're ready, um, I'll be back with a new lecture for the next topics. Bye-bye.